I'm Joel Blackford with Beth Hassett Sabbath Fellowship in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm reminding you one more time what time it is on God's clock as we move through chapter 9. All the other chapters made sense. They were all logical. They all were stuff that I could explain to you. And, and, and I could be a scientist. I could be a geologist. I could be a, a, a cosmonaut. <laughs> and I could explain things to you. I can't explain this one to you. This one, this is the trumpet. So let's blow a shofar. And that's what you're going to hear. The last two of these, uh, almost the, the, the last three, but they're the woes. And this is an illogical chapter from human experience. So we're going to be talking about a star falling from heaven. And this is the fifth trumpet. These are, once again, the last two of the three woes, but because we'll be talking about the third woe that pops up in 11, it'll be part of this. Oh goodness, the scorpion-like locusts. What are they? What size are they? What Are they living therion? We'll discuss therion later on. We'll discuss a little bit in this section and then uh, in chapter 13, a little bit in 11 and 13 and then 16 on. Therion is the most common word used at that point in time. So we'll talk to you about living therion and what it means. Are they angelic? What's going on with this chapter? Why am I saying that this is illogical in human sense? Are they angelic beings or are they a hybrid? We'll talk about it. What's the Abuso? Where is this place? Underneath the earth. What, what, what is chained up underneath the earth? What is the Tahom in the, in the Hebrew? They're both the same, but do we have different ideas of what they mean? What is the seal of God? Is it a literal ink-like seal of God on your forehead? Uh, what is this word stalking? Why would Joel be bringing up the word stalk at this point in time? And, and who gets hurt? And why do they get hurt? And what does hurt mean in terms of these five months that they're allowed to sting you? Um, the Euphrates River, this sounds like uh, Garden of Eden talk. Why is that listed now? Why are we talking about something that really wasn't listed much uh, up after, um, say, uh, uh, Genesis 2? Why is it listed now? And if the godly are raptured, who's left behind at this point in time? Who's being stung? Who's not being stung? And why? May we repent? Is there still free will? We'll talk about that too. Why do we wait for the seventh trumpet? Why, is this, why do we have all of these narrative breaks throughout Revelation? And what's going on? And why are we waiting, waiting until verse 15 of chapter 11 to finish the seventh trumpet? And what does it mean when, when we open up and blast the seventh trumpet? Can I explain this in natural terms? No. Let's just dig through it and see what happens. But I cannot explain this one in natural terms. So let's go through and at least do what I can explain, which is what the disciples were questioning. When is the everyday world ending? When is the marriage supper? What's the sign of your coming? Tell us. Tell us this. And he says, and this is a paraphrase of it, of Matthew 24, watch out, there will be false prophets. There will be great miracles. And yes, even the false prophets can do miracles. Um, people will be led astray. There will be wars. People frightened. There will, be, uh, there will be things like fires in California, which you see already, and floods in Jordan and other places like that. You will see all of these birth pangs, famines, earthquakes, all of these things. They're birth pangs. And uh, this is uh, more from Matthew 24. You will see an increased distance from the Word of God, the Torah. The first five books, you will see people being arrested. You'll see all sorts of problems based on, do you believe the Word of God or do you reject the Word of God? The phrase in here, once, one more time, just so you see it, it's melo ha goyim. At some point in time, the Gentile world ends and God starts re-bringing re his kingdom to this earth. So that would be melo ha goyim in the Hebrew, and that is a phrase from the cross-handed blessing of, um, that would be Genesis 48. This is from Dave Williams. I cite this all the time so you can be aware of this. Just I don't need to go through these every single time, but be aware. Uh, the focus is on the Middle East, and these are 15 reasons. So political deception, chaos, famines, epidemics, all of these things that he cites, these things are happening. But keep in mind, there are charismatic, re re uh, well, we'll call them revivals, so to speak. And then there are also counterfeit revivals. So which one are you a part of? Do you believe in the real Jesus or maybe a false Jesus? And then I cite this because my name is Joel Peter and my parents named me appropriately because this is what I study. I study eschatos, the end times, the eschatology. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also on male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the sky and earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. These are birth pangs before the coming of the great and terrible day of Adonai. And that is Joel. And then Peter 
Peter quotes him in Acts chapter 2. So that is my name, and there is a reason why I do what I do, and for some odd reason I understand things that maybe you've never thought about. So these videos will entice you to study the word more. Please do. My theory that I always purport is that it's a linear theory. It is everything moving forward through the seals with a break before seal number seven, and then that happens in chapter eight as we head into the trumpets. And is it a shofar or a trumpet? It doesn't really matter. It is a blast, and it is an in-gathering. We'll see that in this chapter. Then I believe that, and those happened over, say, the last 50 years, according to my theory. And we are basically on to seal four right now. You'll see that that seems to be the whitest of the ones up there. Then the trumpets occur, and then uh, that hits the midpoint, and then the bowls open up in chapter 16, and that's a long time from now. But when they hit, there's really no turning back at that point in time. And really, after chapter 9 here, there's no turning back. There are many things occurring where you know you're either with God or against God. And these, the, the natural occurrences are ending right now at this point in time. Just be aware of it. Once again, my linear theory that the seven seals open, and it, it resembles birth in terms of if you do 40 weeks times 50 jubilee time frames, then you would come up with 2,000 years, which is about where we are right now after Yeshua was crucified and died and resurrected. Then the first trumpets, or the seven trumpets, would be the first three and a half years, and 42 months we'll call them. Um, and then if you add the three woes that we're talking about right now, together with the seven last bowls, you get ten, which is Egypt. And that's the last three and a half years for the last seven bowls. These are veiled patterns, but remember, you can find your Goshen. You can find your place of safety, your Lot's Lot's cave. You can find a place because you're avoiding God's wrath on the wicked, and he's not bringing wrath against you. And keep in mind, death is not wrath from God. Um, uh, separation from God is wrath. Before we get into this, I want to explain something very, very critical. I want you to be aware that the two witnesses pop up before we go in. So they would be popping up during this time frame, and we're going to see some time date stamps that match up with that. So we're going to be corresponding between chapter 9 and chapter 11 during this video. I believe they go in with us. They do certain activities. So they will be burning for God and the Torah, and they will represent Moses and the prophets. So what will they do before the tribulation? This is my opinion. Beforehand, they will slaughter the red heifer, which is mysterious, and that is from uh, Parsha Huk, from uh, Numbers 19. And it's a mysterious one because they have to be clean, and they're the only clean people that we can think of that are ritually pure. And uh, that's why I think they're here beforehand. They sealed 144,000, I believe, or they're involved in that process. They preach Torah which is Moses, and Moses will be one of them, I believe, and Eliyahu will be the other. But the Torah is Messiah Yeshua's body, so keep in mind, they're just preaching Yeshua. Uh, the, they will prophesy in the Temple Mount area. Uh, they will watch for these time-date stamps, so just be aware of that. They know that they have to hit certain markers, and you'll watch them happen as we go through chapter 9 and chapter 11. Um, they will call down fiery judgments. Well, Moses called down fiery judgments on Egypt, and Eliyahu called down fiery judgments on, uh, well, on Israel, unfortunately. So they will preach these things. Many will reject them, but some, this frightened remnant, will give glory to God. Once again, a picture of Sodom and Gomorrah, and you can see things falling down on them. And then, um, like Eliyahu, the two witnesses call down fire and blood during the first 42 months. If anyone tries to do them harm, fire comes out of their mouth and consumes their enemies. Yes, if anyone tries to harm them, this is how he must die. They have the authority to shut up the sky so that no rain falls during the period of their prophesying. Also, they have the authority to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. So you're seeing some of these activities going on in Revelation 9, but here it's listed in Revelation 11. These are these are, they're separated by a narrative break, chapter 10, which no one can understand that mystery, but 11 and 9 talk to each other. Just keep that in mind. Not chiastically, just literally. Once again, Sodom and Gomorrah, so you can see things falling from the sky. They, there would be fire and ice. I want to run through one more rule here, whether it's a, a trumpet, so to speak. It's my bugle. It's my family bugle. And then this is a shofar. You have to understand trumpet rules going into this one more time. Takiya. Takiya is that long blast. So let's do a takiya. Okay, if that was nine seconds or so or ten seconds long, that would be an in gathering. One of those, if I blow both of these together, that means 
Uh, everybody's called in, but if it's just one, it's just the leaders. And in gatherings such as a king's coronation, many good things are associated with that tachia blast. And in the Greek, that's a selpizo. And just keep in mind that I'm seeing either uh, 4637 or 4636 in the Greek. Those are the words that correspond to selpizo and tachia. They go right straight back to numbers 10. There's no doubt about that. Now, the Shevarim is not listed in the Bible that I know of, but it is something you should be aware of. So that's a brokenness. So if I was blasting and it was kind of wailing, that's, that's, that's not really wailing enough, but a wailing blast is maybe Yom Kippur. This is a time of brokenness, of repentance. So that's a Shevarim. Then the last one is Teruah. Keep in mind that the festival of Yom Teruah, which is Rosh Hashanah in the fall, which is where we think Jesus will return, is going to be nine quick staccato blasts in succession for an alarm, for battle, for war, and that is what only popped up in Revelation 1.1. It doesn't happen again throughout Revelation. The rest of the blasts are related to ingathering or a king's coronation, one or the other, and you get to determine based on what you think the reference is in each application. The last one is really just a tekia that we talked about in the first place, but a gadola, that's big, salpizomegas in the Greek. That means this is the big blast. It's not in chapter 9. It's not in chapter 11, which would be the seventh blast, which leads me to leave that it, believe that it's chapter 19, but it's not even listed there either, so just keep that in mind. David Stern is really the man that I, I run to. He's, he's the guy where I set up the pitch and he hits the home run every single time because he's such a scholar. The first four shofar judgments affect nature directly and people indirectly and resemble the plagues of Egypt, while the last three plagues affect people directly. We're in those last three plagues, and we get to see two of them here. They are they're abysmal. They are, they are so frightening. And so please, you know, buckle up because chapter 9 is a tough chapter. They affect you directly. Once again, these are the seven trumpets. We have done the first four in chapter 8. We're doing five and six right now. Seven is coming up. But, you know, there's an odd little narrative break in chapter 10. But really, we go right straight into 11 after that. And, and that is when you see the seventh one blast. But that is not, that is the kingdom of God being declared. But that is not Jesus' return. That's just the seventh trumpet. That's another trumpet blast. The remaining shofar blasts and judgments are directed not at nature, but at the people living on the earth. You have to determine at this point in time, are you going to be a part of the pagan world or God's world? And the pagan world will be hostile to God, no doubt about it. In order to get them to repent while the sealed are spared, these three woes are announced by the remaining shofar blasts and are described in these chapters, respectively. Just as the seventh seal included the seven shofar judgments, so too the seventh shofar blast includes the seven bowl judgments that are, they begin in chapter 16. Let's look at it from a picture. I love the ancient pictures. They are not biblically accurate. None of these pictures by artists have been big, biblically accurate, but I want you to see them just the same because they're interesting. So you've got the first four on top there and then the three down below affecting the people directly. So that is more biblically accurate. Let's continue on and explain more of this. There's no way to naturally explain the final three trumpets called the three woes. Scientists will explain or blame global warming at first, but when you get to the last three, there's no biblical, scientific, cosmological way to explain what's going on when we get into chapter 9 here in just a minute. Even the eschatologists will not see the patterns developing. They just won't. They, they are looking for other signs, and they don't understand the patterns in general. There are Most eschatologists are just... They're nice, sweet preachers. They're trying to preach to you, but they, they are really promoting, in most cases, a white lie. They're, they're telling you about Jesus, but they're not really saying this is how it's going to be. So let's discuss the brutal truth of chapter 9. The brutal truth is, I think this is linked to Genesis 6, 4, which is the angels procreating with women on the earth. So let's discuss Genesis 6, 4. The Nephilim. And that's what it says in the Hebrew text, the alien human hybrids, the angelic human hybrids, were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, so keep that in mind, they're before the flood and after the flood. It's in the text, people. When the sons of God, the angels, and it says, Ben-Eha Elohim, that's what it says in the text, 
came in, and that's a general reference to the angels, came into the daughters of men. It's bat Adam. There's no doubt about it in the text. And they bore children to them. And they were the ancient heroes. These were powerful, mighty men, men of renown. And I saw the people on earth were very wicked, and that all the imaginings of their hearts were always of evil only. Adonai regretted that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved his heart. So what did he do? He flooded the earth because the Nephilim were bewitching giants from ancient days, men of renown who lived before and after the flood of Noah. They're cited, obviously, as I just read to you, but they're after the flood, too, in Numbers 13.33. What we don't know, who are the Nephilim and how and why did they survive the flood, or, or why would they die during the flood and then pop up again? We don't understand that. It's not listed, but there they are, before and after. We know that they are described in chapter 9. So that's why this is a difficult chapter. They will be stalking, just like the original Nephilim. They will be scorpion-like creatures listed here, um, coming from deep within the earth and unchained by a fallen star, which is an angel, believe it or not, to begin stalking man on the earth. This is reminiscent of what we just read in Genesis 6-4. Let's continue on and see things that they aren't explainable in physical terms. Once again, global warming will be used, but these disasters, when you read them, you'll say, okay, these are nine-foot-tall scorpion-like aliens stalking us. That is not global warming. And there will be immense blessing for those sealed with the seal of God. If you take the mark of the beast, this will be the end of you. You will, you will be stung, and you will be hurt, and it will be horrific. Once again, three woes plus seven bulls is ten, just like Egypt. This is a picture similar to Enoch of Revelation 9, the locusts. It's an artist's recreation of it. It's not that accurate, but they're ugly. They're ugly, and they come from the underworld. Um, who let them out? An angel, believe it or not. So it's sent from the Lord. Let's go into Enoch just so you can see. I have to describe Enoch to describe this chapter because we have to deal with this Nephilim topic. In those days, when the children of man had multiplied, and it happened that there were born unto them handsome and beautiful daughters, and the angels, the children of heaven, saw them and desired them, and they said to one another, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves uh, from among the daughters of man, and beget us children. And Samias, uh, being the leader, said unto them, I fear that perhaps you will not consent that this deed should be done, and I alone will become responsible for this great sin. But they all responded to him in a vow, Let us all swear an oath, and bind everyone among us by a curse, not to abandon this suggestion, but do, to, uh, but do the deed. Then they all swore together and bound one another by the curse, and it is. And they were all together, 200, and they descended to Ardos, which is Mount Hermon. And that's up in the north of Israel. And they called the Mount Harmon, and they swore and bound each other by the curse. And their names were, and I'm not going to repeat the names, but these are the names. You can read them for yourself. These are the chiefs of the tens of all the others with them. And they took wives unto themselves, and everyone respectively chose one woman for himself, and they began to go into them, and they taught them magical medicine, pharmacia we'll call it, drugs, incantations, cutting of roots, taught them about plants. The women became pregnant and gave birth to great giants whose heights were 300 cubits. These giants consumed the produce of all the people, and finally the people started, detested feeding them, so the giants turned against the people and ate them. Cannibalism, yes. And they began to sin against the birds, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and fish, and their flesh was devoured. The, uh, they were by the one and the other. They drank blood, which you're not supposed to do. And then the earth brought an accusation against their oppressors. I'm saying that they're huge. So there's a man way off to the side, and then the giant on this side, and they're huge compared to, comparatively. Their bones are scattered across the world today, and you'll see it. If you go to Steve Coyle's site, you can see these giants. They're there. Continuing on in Enoch 15, For what reason have you abandoned the high Kodesh, the holy places up in heaven, the eternal heaven, and slept with women and defiled yourself with the daughters of the people, taking wives, acting like the children of the earth? There's supposed to be a separation. We're human. We're, we're basically, I'll, I'll compare it to, we're living beings. Like animals and humans are very similar. We share an animal soul. So if you're petting your dog right now, you share something in common with your dog, a living nephesh, we call it in the Hebrew. And at some point in time, the angels, when they come down, they produce something that's completely different. And angels are supposed to be separate from us, but in this case, they cohabited, and they weren't supposed to do that. And so they begat these giant sons. Surely you used to be holy, spiritual living ones, possessing eternal life, which we don't. But now you have defiled yourselves with women and with the lifeblood and the flesh begetting children, and you have lusted with the blood of the people, like them producing blood and flesh, which die and perish. People perish. Angels don't. We shouldn't be mixing. 
Now you're going to say, Joel, you just quoted Enoch. I don't believe in Enoch. Well, Jesus quoted Enoch. So keep this in mind. This is Enoch 15, and we'll compare it to Matthew 22 in just a moment here. On that account, I have given you wives in order that seeds might be sown among, among, upon them and children born by them so that the deeds that are done upon the earth will not be withheld from you. Indeed, formerly you were spiritual, having eternal life and immortal in all the generations of the world. That is why formerly I did not make wives for you. For the dwelling of the spiritual beings of heaven is heaven. Now let's look at Matthew 22, where the, uh, there are Pharisees which believe in the resurrection and Sadducees that don't. And they really only read the first five books of Moses. They don't cite much else. And there isn't much listed in the, the whole books of what we call the Old Testament. Really, unless you read Job chapter 19, and unless you dig into Daniel 12, there isn't much talk, talking about the resurrection. You have to study Jesus. So we will. And after them, seven husbands, the woman died. Now in the resurrection, which of the seven, which wife will she be? For all married her. Yeshua answered them and said, the reason you go astray is that you are ignorant of both the Tanakh, which is Enoch included, obviously, because it's the only place cited where this is cited, and the power of God to resurrect. For in the resurrection, neither men nor women will marry. Rather, they will be like the angels in heaven. So only in the Enoch do we have this listed where it makes sense. So let's go back to 15 one more time and then take that knowledge and realize this might be scripture, people. But now the giants who are born from the union of the spirits of flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth because their dwelling shall be upon the earth and inside the earth evil spirits shall have come out of their bodies because from the day that they were created from the Kodesh ones, the holy ones, they became the watchers. The first origin is the spiritual foundation. They will become evil upon the earth and shall be called evil spirits. Dwell, the dwelling of the spiritual beings of heaven is heaven, but the dwelling of the spirits of the earth which were born upon the earth is the earth. The spirits of the giants oppress each other. They will corrupt, fall, and be excited, and fall upon the earth and cause sorrow. They eat no food, nor become thirsty, nor find obstacles. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of the people and against the women, because they have proceeded forth from them. Continuing on, this is Peter's version. So this is what you would accept as scripture. God did not spare the angels who sinned. On the contrary, he put them into gloomy dungeons, lower than Sheol. The word in the Greek is Tartarus. That's only listed one time. So it's lower than the typical depth. So let's pretend that Sheol is just underneath the ground. But Tartarus is way down deep. That's where he changed them. Held for judgment to the day of the Lord. That's when the judgment occurs. And he did not spare the ancient world. On the contrary, he preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, and seven others, and brought the flood upon the world of ungodly people, and he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're going to see some of these activities going on, the condemnation and, and some of these uh, unnatural disasters, reducing them to ashes and ruin, as a warning to those in the future who would live ungodly lives. But he rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the debauchery of those unprincipled people. And that, once again, is for sure scripture. We know, to, we know about that, but we rarely talk about it. Continuing on into Enoch 54, fetter him hand and foot and cast him into darkness. On the day of the great judgment, he will be led off to the blazing fire. That sounds like what we're going to get to as we head up to chapters 18 and 19 of Revelation. And I asked the angel of peace who went with me, for whom are these chains being prepared? And he said to me, these are being prepared for the host of Azazel. And that's the Yom Kippur service. Azazel is this wicked goat demon of the wilderness. And he's in the Hebrew text. That they may take take them and throw them into the abyss of complete judgment with the jagged rocks. They will cover their jaws as the, the Lord of Spirits commanded. So what I'm mentioning to you is that there will be this judgment time frame. In the meantime, they are chained, but we see something being released in chapter 9. So now we're ready to head into this fifth trumpet and say, what are these creatures? This is an artist's recreation of somebody trumpeting and somebody popping up from the center of the earth, from the abyss, the abuso in the Greek. They will hunt you. That is the weird thing going on in chapter 9. That's why I'm arguing that they're not angelic, they're not human, they don't have a living nephesh, so to speak. They will be some kind of a chimera, a hybrid, whatever we'll call it. That's what they will remind you of in terms of they will be very, very powerful and you will be their prey. That's what's in the text, so read it with me, see if you agree. The fifth angel sounded his tekiah. So once again, that's that long blast of ingathering, his shofar. That means come back to your homes and, and get it to a safe place. And I saw a star. 
Stars are usually associated with angels. So this is an angel that had fallen out of heaven onto the earth and he was given the key to the shaft leading down to the abuso, this to home, this way deep section of the earth. And he opened the shaft of the abuso and there went up smoke from the shaft and the smoke of a huge furnace. And the sun was darkened and the sky too by the smoke of the shaft. And then out of the smoke onto the earth came locusts. It's akris in the Greek. There's no size listed, so keep in mind, we keep on thinking, oh, they're about the size of my mouse clicker here. No, 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 no. They're huge. They're nine feet tall, these locusts. And the word is akris in the Greek, but there's a, there's a, <laughs> there's a D in there also. So it, it's also akridos or akridis and, or akudan, which could be acrid in, in our language. They, they'll stink, just keep in mind. And they were given power, ex, exousia. And uh, that, is, that is delegated power. They have the right. We're going to discuss that more in part B of this video. So you'll see what that word means. But right now, just keep in mind, they have the power, just like the power scorpions have right now. So do you see it listed there? Scorpions have exousia right now to be able to sting you. So if you walk into their turf, they have every right to sting you. And a snake does too. Certain critters have the right to do what they do because God delegated it to them. They have exousia right now to sting you, bite you, hurt you, because you should be doing something more safe. You shouldn't be playing around with those types of animals. You know where they are. Here's another picture coming out of this great abyss. And they're scorpion-like locusts. And they stink. The smoke of a huge furnace. And I wanted to show that acrid again. You will smell this opening up. Continuing on in chapter 9, you won't die for five months. They were instructed not to harm the grass on the earth or any green plant or tree, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. The locusts, once again, size is not listed there, were not allowed to kill them, only to inflict pain on them for five months. And the pain they caused is like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. This means they're coming against the people. Everybody's on the planet at this point in time, but they're only coming against those that lack the seal of God. So what is the seal of God? Let's, let's show you another picture. This is a tiny picture from L.A. Marzulli. He's one of the guys out there always looking for Nephilim, for little, tiny, or whatever they are. The problem is with this, it seems like it's an artist's recreation because they're tiny. No, they're huge. According to the open dreams that I have from two friends, these are going to be huge critters, and they're going to be nasty, and they're going to be very, very powerful. Let's continue on and look at the other time that we see the mark of God listed in Ezekiel chapter 9, which reminds me of Revelation chapter 9. Then he cried loudly in my ear, Summon the commanders of the city, each one holding his weapon of destruction at once. Six men, I'm arguing these are angels, they're the harvesters, the catesers, and they approach because they go out and they do these types of killings or harvesting, so to speak. And they approached on the path from the upper gate to the north, each one holding his weapon of destruction. Among them was a man, the seventh in this case, clothed in linen, that's angelic, and with a scribe's writing implement at his waist, and they entered and stood by the bronze altar. So the bronze altar is the ochelet, that's the altar where you would burn sacrifices. Uh, it's not the incense altar, and that's where killing occurs. Then the glory of the Lord of Israel was made up to go up over the cherub, over the, 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 the cherubim are the close angels that would be inside the holiest of holy in the tabernacle or the temple, where it had been to the threshold of the house. This is the mark that this one angel puts on people. So he grabs some ink and he puts the mark on you. There are two letters there. The first one to my right, we'll call it, is the Aleph, which looks like a bull in the paleo. And then the paleo tov is a cross. It's a broken cross, kind of. It's not perfect or anything like that. And when you think of Yeshua's death, it wasn't really a beautiful cross. It wasn't a pretty scene. I put an X, a red X below it, so you can see what it looks like in the Paleo. It is reminiscent, oddly enough, of um, the Lent stuff that goes on in the Catholic and the Lutheran churches. I know, it seems bizarre, but that reminds me of that. Um, and once again, we are not commanded to put tattoos on us, but this is just an ink mark, or either it's literal or figurative, but when somebody tells you you need to put the mark of God on you, and it seems to make sense in your spirit, just do it, okay? Don't argue with anybody. And in this case, you would die, because we're going to continue on in, in Ezekiel 9 and see. They're going to start killing people that don't have the mark. He called to the man clothed in linen, the angel, I say, who had the scribe's writing implement at his waist. And Adonai said to him, go throughout the city, throughout all of Jerusalem, and put a mark, literally a paleotob that you just saw, and it is reminiscent of Revelation 9, 4, 
on the foreheads of all the men who are sighing and crying over the disgusting practices. So they're praying that God will forgive these disgusting practices and that have been committed in it. And to the others, I heard him say, go throughout the city and strike and kill and do not spare anybody. Have no pity on these people that will not take the mark. Sounds like Revelation 9 4, doesn't it? This is another artist's recreation of what it looks like. The long tail with the stinger on the end, the long hair, the, the wings, um, of the horse-like structure, or I would argue goat-like legs. So just keep that in mind as we move into Part B. You'll want to watch Part B. There's going to be more of the backstory explained. Let's continue on in Revelation 9. Now these stinky locusts. And once again, I want to point out that the word, it's acridone in this case. And that would remind me of stinky locusts. And size is not listed again, but they are looked like horses. Well, horses are not little tiny guys by your feet. They're huge. Horses can be nine feet tall, outfitted for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. They had hair like women's hair. Their teeth were like those of lions. And their chests were iron breastplates. And the sound of their wings made the roar of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. If they're nine feet tall and they look like this, this would be frightening. And they're coming after people without the mark. If you have the mark, you will be fine for the moment. But we'll talk about that in the backstory. So once again, watch my next video. Here's another picture of what they look like. But if they're nine feet tall, they're huge and powerful. Continuing on in Revelation 9, the five-month time date stamp that we have to discuss because it pops up again later on. They had tails like those of scorpions with stings, and in their tails was the power exousia, a delegated power to hurt people, five months, time date stamp. They had a king. Oh my goodness, they had a king. They had a leader. So they march like a military formation with this king. And he's 12 feet tall in this open vision that you'll see in the next video. Over the uh, angel of the abyss, whose name in the Hebrew. Now notice John is writing in Greek, but he's writing Hebrew first because these are for Hebrew speakers and also... The concept of this is a Hebrew concept. Hebrew is the language. That is the language that's written in most of the Bible. And I study Hebrew much more than my Greek. So you'll notice I mangle the Greek, and I'm sorry for that. But the point is Hebrew comes first. Greek is just a, a translation. It's like English for us. It's just a language. Hebrew has the meaning. And so if I'm looking for depth of meaning, I look into the Hebrew. His name is Abaddon or Destroyer, it doesn't matter. The Hebrew and the Greek are exactly the same thing, but he is the king and he will be 12 feet tall and I'll describe that more in the second video, the second half. This is a more accurate portrayal of what these little things would look like. Big, sharp, nasty teeth, long hair, wings, noises, uh, powerful, huge and powerful, but more goat-like in the legs, so keep that in mind. I have to cite this because we need verses that cite these types of activities in scorpions, so to speak. So I'm citing something, we see scorpions listed twice in 1 Kings. And dealing with judgment, because Jeroboam is in, the no is in the north, and Rehoboam is in the south, and Jeroboam says, we are not going down south. If you want me to explain this more, go back to my chapter 6 and look at the false Sukkot of 2012, which should be the third seal of chapter 6. So just refer back to that if you want to know more about Jeroboam and Rehoboam. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. It doesn't say that in the text, and I'm not going to be graphic, but it's, it's gross. He's talking about his father's manlyhood. Yes, my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, but I will make it heavier. My father controlled you with whips, but I will control you with scorpions. And scorpions, in this case, are designed as judgment. Once again, exousia. They are given the ability to go out and do what they do. God gives them that power. So he will control them, and he is given that power. Jeroboam and Rehoboam in this case, this is Rehoboam speaking here, um, but what, this is what causes that false Sukkot of Jeroboam in the north. So come again on the third day, and the king answered the people harshly, abandoning the advice that the older man had given him, the good advice he addressed them in accordance to the advice of the young men that are unwise, and said, my, uh, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father controlled you with whips, but I will control you with scorpions. And that is what is going to happen in the end times. Ezekiel talks about scorpions this way. Preach amongst them. As for you, human being, don't be afraid of them or their words, even if briars and thorns around you, uh, you, you sit among scorpions. And we will, as the godly, will sit among these scorpions. Don't be afraid of their words or be upset by their looks. 
for they are a, a rebellious house. And that is what's going on in chapter 9. You are to speak my words to them, whether they listen or not, for they are rebellious. And that's Pasha. They're really rebellious. That's a word that I, I talk about. If you ever go to my particular church, you'll hear that word used all the time, avon sins and Pasha sins, rebellious sins. But you, human being, hear what I am telling you. Don't you be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I will give you. He gets the scroll right after this. He'll be eating that. It is time to take a break. This is the first half. The second half gets even worse. But you have to watch this. You have to be aware of this. So please watch with me. Thank you for your time. Stay tuned for part B.